This is lecture number two, System Thinking uh, Part One. And this is part of uh, this course on the introduction to systems engineering and also system thinking and analysis. So the references uh, for this lecture are a little bit different from the ones that we discussed uh, previously. Uh, now we are, I'm using the two other books, uh, System Thinking, Managing Cause and Complexity and Advanced Systems Thinking, Engineering and Management. So the agenda for today is as follows. We're gonna start our discussion of what is system thinking. Then we are gonna discuss what basic system models are. And then we're gonna talk about the fundamental system constructs. And finally, we're gonna discuss what the fundamental system principles are. So let's start with uh, what is system thinking. Um, so I, I always try to bring some of these quotes to the class. I think those are interesting and, and we can uh, relate to some of these quotes from famous people in, in terms of what are, uh, what are the goals for, for what we are learning in class. And this quote from William Fulbright in, on March 25th, 1964 says, we must dare to think about unthinkable things because when things become unthinkable, thinking stops and action becomes mindless. So some of the things that we, uh, some of the goals that we set up as systems engineers, uh, some of the problems that we try to tackle uh, systems engineer, as a system engineer are, uh, they are sometimes look like things that we cannot achieve, uh, but we must dare to think about those things and find ways to, to get to those goals and implement systems that are not only reliable, but successful in accomplish those uh, missions. So what is system thinking? System thinking is re relatively recent, at least as an identifiable practice. There are books on the subject, but different authors view the subject differently. So it is as it's yet an unconstrained discipline. Our focus is on the key concepts and how those relate to uh, systems engineering of system thinking and see how are they part of systems engineering. So in the mechanistic world view, the goal of science was analysis, the breaking down of phenomena into even smaller parts isolation of individual causal factors. The breakdown includes organisms in terms of cells, processes in terms of activities, behavior in terms of reflexes, mass in terms of atoms, and we have many, many other uh, examples that we can use. But the idea is we go, we, we study, we understand, and we try to break things into smaller pieces. The idea of individual units acting on their own in one way, caus causality proof insufficient to explain the observed phenomena. So understanding things by just cause and effect um, in one way was limited in terms of explaining some of the um, observed phenomena. In the same vein, the mechanistic worldview had difficulties with ideas of directed behavior or teleology. So analysis down to individual isolated components erases all trace of directed, adaptive, or goal-seeking behavior. And that's what's viewed as mysterious and beyond the realm of scientific research. Organization of people or organisms were inaccessible to mechanistic science, which was concerned with grow hierarchy, structure, dominance, and submissions, control, and so on, none which appear in physics. So as you can see with these examples and this information, there was a gap in terms of including all these behavior related um, inputs and how they were influencing the behavior of systems. 
The concept of open systems emerged in response to the shortcomings of the mechanistic world viewpoint. Open systems is fundamental in modern biology. Basis of open systems is dynamic interactions of its components. Know that this is differentiated from this cybernetic uh, model, which is based on feedback. And we're gonna talk about that model in a few minutes. So what are the open system? What are the characteristics of an open system? First, they are able to ingest and produce waste. Also, they are able to reproduce, can exhibit growth, can be stable at high energy levels, and they can also die. The theory of open system is part of general system theory. Okay, so these are characteristics of open systems, and they are tied to what we know as system thinking. So what are the basic models for uh, these theory? So there are basic models and there, these are the ones that are listed uh, as part of this uh, course. Uh, first, we have the hierarchy Poshek model. Second, we have the open system model. Third, we have the cybernetic model. Four, we have open loop control model. And number five is the process model. Number six is the pipeline model. Number seven is the transport model. And finally, one that you're familiar with, the queuing model. So in the hierarchy Poshek model, we have a way to represent hierarchy in terms of um, levels for uh, a system. So for example, we can have levels for several persons with different skills. This can form a, another level which we can call a maintenance team. And if we combine multiple maintenance teams, um, we can create what we uh, known as an operations and logistic team to form an operational unit. And if the operational unit joins with a helicopter and communication units to form a rapid reaction force. So as you can see, we can start with several persons with different skills and we start grouping those persons to form another level, which could be a team. And then we combine multiple teams, form a operational unit. If we combine multiple operational units, we can form a what we call a rapid response force. So the hierarchy model or the hierarchy project model is trying to illustrate that, um, that hierarchy in which you can see, for example, in this figure 1.2, we have a pull check model of systems, containment, and hierarchy. You can see that we have circles. The main circle is basically representing the overall system. And as you go inside that big circle, you have three other circles that are representing the union of three similar circles that in addition uh, of being part of the subsistence of these larger circle, inside of them have additional components. So if you go and look at the bottom to, the, to your right, there's a subsystem, uh, the Serato pointing into the subsystems, which are multiple um, units forming a, 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 another group, which will be the second level. And then the second level forming a third level, which is the overall representation of the system. Uh, we also have different things happening in this diagram. We have uh, multiple concepts associated with the diagram. We have the interconnections that are connecting the subsystems. Uh, we have a subsystem at the second level that are connecting other subsystems. Uh, the, the segments that are connecting the circles are called interconnections. And uh, the environment is everything surrounding those subsystems. Um, the circle is rep representing the containment. Uh, so every circle is containing some uh, level of organization inside of it. So the Polchek model is one of my favorite diagrams in terms of representing 
the, the structure, the hierarchy of a complex system. Um, we have another model here, typically used in the system thinking theory. Uh, this is called the open system model. And what we know about open systems is that there are stabilized at high energy levels. They can exhibit a variety of behaviors. They comply with physical conservation laws and exception to conservation principle uh, is the information because that can be given away, just still re be retained. Um, so here we have an example in terms of uh, what is the dynamic system in, in which we have inputs coming in. We have containment systems, contained systems inside this big circle. Uh, as we saw in the previous example, this could be subsystems. In this case, they are not connected, uh, but they represent a, the overall system, the dynamic open system. And then you have the environment and then you have the contained system working together. You have an input that is called an inflow. This could be energy, resources, information. And then the interaction with the system creates an outflow, which could be residue, product, waste, dissipation, and information. Um, the system will have order, structure, capacity, contents, information, properties, capabilities, and behavior. So again, another way to represent a system, um, for example, if you look at a car, the inflows will be the driver, the way that this person drives the vehicle, uh, oil, gas, air, information, and the outflow will be also the driver getting to the desired uh, location, emissions, heat, motion, electricity. Okay, so everything, uh, we get the input into the system, uh, there's uh, a lot of things happening inside the system and then we get some outflows out of it. Inside the circle, we have the dynamic interactions of the system's elements. This is the model that we mentioned, um, the cybernetic model. And what this does is compares um, the, the output with the input. So we, we have uh, our desired output and for, for this desired output to happen, we need to go through this process of, of uh, steps or uh, subsystems that will allow you to get to that actual output of the system. Um, so in this case, the cybernetic model has four boxes. Uh, we have a control unit, activation unit, and control process uh, that deals with the environmental disturbance. And then we have an actual, actual output, and then we also have a feedback loop to the control unit. So the idea here is that you have a, a goal that you want to achieve, but you know in order to get to that goal, you have to go to this step or sequence of events. And these boxes are representing those that sequence of events um, from a technology point of view. So let's say, for example, that we our desired output is 75 miles per hour. And after, uh, let's say, pressing the, the gas pedal, uh, the system looks like uh, you are 75, 77 miles per hour instead of 75. So if you're in cruise control in your vehicle, the system is going to recognize, uh, the control unit is gonna compare the actual with the desired output. The actuation unit receives the signal from the control unit and responds by making changes in the control process. Uh, the control process is that which is being controlled and the information system measures out actual output and relays information to the control unit. So if we need to, if we our desired output is 75 miles per hour, then we, we expect to see a correction in the system that will get you to that desired output. 
cybernetic model can also be applied in um, these control um, systems for um, airplane, airplane landing. So we have a transmitter, we have a physical interface, um, and we have a, a radio control air vehicle. Um, so if we, if we deal with this uh, interaction, uh, we have a, a radio control air vehicle that is trying to land, for instance. So we want to control everything from, from the, um, from this encoder or the physical interface. And there's gonna be some information being transmitted through uh, an antenna. So if we want um, this airplane to land a specific velocity or speed, then we will adapt or we send that information and the system inside the airplane is going to act in order to achieve that desired output. So that in general represents what is called the cybernetic model. Uh, an open loop control model. This is um, another interesting system thinking um, diagram. Uh, what it represents is the feedback loop between uh, mental models. So we have a mental model. This is what I think, uh, how I think things should be done. And then there's an environment and then there's the actual output, which are the tasks to be achieved. <clears throat> the question is, if I'm not in charge of executing these instructions and I have a mental model of how things should be executed, how uh, the model represents how the instructions are transmitted. And also by looking at the output after the instructions are, are passed to the actor is some type of uh, feedback is needed to correct some of the actions performed by the actor that received the instructions. So this is seen a lot in management positions. Uh, this open loop control model. Uh, you, as a manager, there's some activities that you want your employees to accomplish. You have a mental model in your mind that about how things needs to be accomplished. You um, pass the instructions to your employees in a way that you think uh, will be enough for them to execute the proposed task but that doesn't necessarily mean that the actions will be interpreted in the same way. So that's what this is representing. Also, this could be applied to uh, the university. Um, the military, officers and soldiers, professors to students and so on. Um, this other model is called the process model. This one you're more familiar with. Uh, or at least have some experience with. Um, so this looking at a, let's say a manufacturing um, company that, um, and all the pieces that are part of these, uh, the processes that happen inside the manufacturing. Um, so we have a process, let's say we are manufacturing parts uh, but in order to achieve that, we need to have a financial model, a resource model. So staff that is needed to run the, the operations, materials, tools, and facilities. And then there, there's some competition at the bottom you see between these entities that are part of your resource model in terms of, uh, let's say, budget requirements and, and other things. So who needs more, who needs more in terms of achieving the, the goals of the company? So that this is the process model in context. Uh, you have information going from processes to resource models, and actually also you study the impact of external suppliers or external supply. So how is that impacting your, for example, your resource model? Do you have competitors in terms of your suppliers? Is that gonna make you uh, save some money 
if, uh, where compared to having only one supplier. If you have only one supplier, then there's no competition, prices can go up. But if you have multiple suppliers and you have some competition, prices can go down. Uh, also, having multiple suppliers, you have to look at reliability. So how good are the, the parts processed by these suppliers? But in essence, this, this process model is looking at all those aspects and try to map all the activities and all the actors that are part of your, of your manufacturing process in this case. Um, so you have also initiation and outcome. Those are tied to your process model. But as you can see in this diagram, that process is depending on multiple parts that are not necessarily easy to see when you are inside the manufacturing process. But if you think as a systems engineer, you can see that are, there are many players in this process that can affect your out, actual outcome in this process. Uh, the pipeline model, this one is um, also a pretty uh, good in this one. We have uh, basically the idea is that you have a state-by-stage -stage, uh, process in which you complete one step and then you move to the next one. Um, so process one completed, then you move to the second process, complete that process, move to the next one. Um, so this is like a series of, of steps happening one after the other. Um, we have the, the circle process. This is more like a loop, loop type of process. Um, and then we have a, an example at the bottom of the slide that is showing um, the process for police and criminal justice as a pipeline system. So the pipeline is basically happening at the center of the diagram in which you have um, command and control, custody, crime information, and criminal justice. But as you can see also in the diagram, there are other parts that are affecting your, um, your final uh, output in the case of the, of the pipeline model. Uh, this model right here is, the, is what's called the transport model. It's similar to the Pocheck model that we showed um, in the in the first model discussed. Um, but the idea here is that you have those elements, these two arrows representing two different modes of transporting or sending messages between systems. Uh, and I think that's the major difference. Uh, you have transport one that could be a way of, of communicating or, or a, from the system perspective, like one type of interface between subsystems. And then transport two, which has a different arrow, has a different way of representing the communication between those or connections between those subsystems. A QA model is one of those models that you're very familiar with. Um, these are very useful in uh, studying systems. Um, the, the idea is that you can, um, based on the performance or the rate of production of a server and the arrivals uh, that you are seeing in that server, you can compute many performance measurements like the queue length, uh, queue time, and, and so on. So this is representing the classic queue model and figure 1.13 different queuing arrangements in which you have one queue, multiple servers, one queue per server, or you have queues happening in different areas of your system. 
Uh, so now let's talk about the fundamental system constructs. Uh, the following set of constructs are fundamental and common to all systems of whatever kind, real or abstract. The first one is called interaction. Second one is configuration. The third one is architecture. Fourth is containment. Five is complementation. Six is hierarchy. And seven is emergence. So now we are gonna go through each one of them. So again, these are fundamental system constructs and they are common to all systems of whatever kind. And these are important things to, to remember. Um, let's start with interaction. Uh, what this means is that all elements of a system are interconnected to allow for interactions. Uh, so conservation laws apply except for information flows. Uh, configuration, since the elements of any system are interrelated, the parts and their interrelationships form patterns or configuration. Architecture, this is related to configuration, is fundamentally the structure created by grouping and linking parts to form interacting subsystems and systems. Containment is the demarcation of a number of complementary parts within a set, within a set boundary to form a system or a subsystem. So in this case, the boundary is pretty clear in the figure at the bottom. The boundary will be the circles representing the limits for each one of the system, for the system and for its uh, subsystems. Complementation is the ability of parts of a system to complement each other such that all mutually contribute through interaction to the whole system. Hierarchy, we talk about hierarchy already, is the vertical structure formed when complementary parts form a complete whole that can then be considered as a unit with its own properties capabilities and behaviors. Emergence is the phenomenon of properties, capabilities and behaviors, evident in the whole system that are not exclusively ascribable to any of its parts. So for example, if you remember your uh, chemistry course, if you remember the compound in which you mix uh, nitrogen and hydrogen colorless, which is colorless and nitrogen that is gas, you get ammonia. None of those two um, elements or components that were mixed had any colors, but when you put them together, you get this new color. That is a property known as emergence. By themselves, these pieces have no color, but when you put them together, there's a property that shows, in this case is that yellowish color, that's the emergence property. So emergence, the source is interaction. Emergence properties include attributes observable from outside, emergent capabilities, limits of functionality, and emergent behaviors are responses to stimuli. Okay, so we know a little bit now about fundamental system constructs. The next item is to understand what fundamental system principles are. So as mentioned it already, we have seven fundamental system constructs that are listed at the top of this slide. Uh, but now we're gonna look at this, what we call system principles, which is a general rule or other statement of truth about systems in general. These system principles are openness, purposefulness, multidimensionality, the emergent property, and counterintuitiveness. Okay, so these five principles acting together as an interactive whole 
define essential characteristics and assumptions about the behavior of an organization viewed as a purposeful and multi-minded system. So the five principles, one more time, they're listed in this diagram. And this system methodology cannot be separated from these system principles. Okay, so these principles are real and they are present in every single system. So the first uh, principle is the openness, which means that the behavior of living open system can be understood only in the context of their environment. Okay, so if we want to understand the behavior of a living system or open system, we need to understand the environment. So open system by default are guided by an internal code of conduct that could be DNA of code or culture. If left alone, open systems tend to reproduce themselves. So openness is represented by this figure 2.2 in this slide. Um, so we have the predict and prepare, manage downward, this administrative skill. So as environment, we have uncontrolled variables and control variables. And in the system, we also have the contextual environment and transactional environment. So we appreciate, we have influence, which is the transactional environment and the system offers some type of control. And then based on that, we recreate the future, uh, manage upward, which includes the boss, the supplier, the customer, and the employee. So again, what this is trying to uh, illustrate is uh, the connection between the system, the contextual environment, the transactional environment, and the um, and environment itself, uh, which are the uncontrolled variables and controlled variables. Uh, the second, is the purposefulness and a purposeful system is one that can produce not only the same outcome in different ways in the same environment, but different outcomes in both the same and different environments. Okay, so um, again, we're looking at the hierarchy of influence. So we have information, knowledge and understanding. Um, and then we also have rational, emotional, and cultural choices. And we have different dimensions of decisions. So the world is not run by those who are right. It is run by those who can convince others that they are right. Okay, so that's tied to this um, system property uh, purpose of fullness. Um, so behavioral classification of systems, we have uh, behavior means and ends. So we have passive um, behaviors. These are tools. Uh, their means are to fix and the end function is also to fix. We also have behavior that are reactive. These are self-maintaining systems. They means are variables and determined. They have different structures in different environments. And the fix, the end function is to fix one function in all environments. Um, we also have systems which behavior is responsive. Uh, these are goal seeking systems. They have different structures in the same environment and different functions in different environments. And we also have behaviors that are active. These are purposeful systems. Uh, they have different structures in the same environment and also have different functions in the same environment. So some examples uh, of passive, this could be a hammer has no choice of me and perform the same function. Uh, reactive, these could be heating, ventilation, and air, HVAC systems, they have no choice of means and they perform the same function. Uh, responsive or goal-seeking system, these are um, 
real alive systems. In this case, they are Moiva. Uh, choice of means is seeking food in different ways in the same or different environments, and they perform the same function. And then we have the purposeful need systems. We can um, refer to the humans, uh, which choice of means is to learn and adapt, and choice of functions have the capabilities of both self-maintaining and goal-seeking systems. Um, the third element uh, principle is the multidimensionality. And this is probably one of the most potent principles of system thinking. It is the ability to see complementary relations in opposing tendencies and to create feasible holes with unfeasible parts. The principle of multidimensionality maintains that opposing tendencies not only coexist and interact, but also form a complementary relationship. So here's some examples. Um, we have some square diagrams uh, that try to represent um, tendencies. So for example, 2.7 has tendency high and low, tendency B low and high. And um, so in this case, high, high low means lose, win, high, high, win, win, low, high, win, lose, and so on. Um, we have, I like the one at the bottom, which is the ability to find difference among objects, which seems to be similar. And then to the left, we have the ability to find similarities among ob objects, which seems to be different. And based on those abilities, we can classify um, people between problem solvers, innovators, problem formulators, or imitators and doers. So these are multiple dimensions uh, based on the different abilities or the concerns that people can show. But the multidimensionality, again, is one of those uh, principles that are very important because you can see when you look at different dimensions of the same problem, that behaviors can change based on the dimensions, even though it's the same problem. But if you change the dimension of the problem, you make them bigger, you make it smaller, there could be a different reaction for the system. So another uh, one like one of those examples is again, looking at human behavior, uh, this principle of multidimensionality. Let's say that, um, how can you distinguish between low and high tendency? Okay, so look at this example. So if I make $10 a week, that's not a lot of money. So I might eat one burger, let's say one burger a week. You might go to a fast food restaurant. I'm making a lot of money, but I can use some of that money to buy a burger. If I increase my salary to $20 a week, now I have more money so that can change the behavior. So instead of buying just one burger, I might eat two. If I make $30 a week, I might try three burgers in a week. But when you start making a huge, uh, in, a huge increase in your salary, for example, if I make 1,000 a week, then I'm no longer eating burgers. I might try to steak uh, instead. So a quantitative change in my income at some point has produced a qualitative change in my way of life. That is the point of distinction between low and the high level of income. Now let's look at a different way, uh, a different example. So how about a fuel price influence on driving behavior? So if the gas price is $2.50 cent, uh, $2 per gallon, then you might consider driving an SUV. But if the price goes up, then you're no longer seeing the SUV as an option. You might think about buying a hybrid. Or if it goes $10 per gallon, then you might think about buying an electric car. At some point, uh, if it goes so high that it $15 per gallon, you might decide not to drive any longer. Maybe I'll just go and buy a bike and bike to this, the university. So again, a difference, a quantitative change in um, the price 
has produced a qualitative change in your way of life. And that's the principle of multidimensionality. Number four is the emergent property. Uh, this type of property um, is again related to the system construct of emergence. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a property that is not evident by just looking or, or by looking at the parts of a system by themselves is something that when you put together the pieces is going to show. So if you think about um, sports, um, the best team is not necessarily um, the best team in the league. The, I mean, the, the team that has the best player, they're not necessarily because they have the best players will be the best team of the, of the league. Um, because there are some properties uh, that there's some interaction that needs to happen in order for the team to work together to achieve the goals. Um, so, and that's the emergent property is what happens when you put together all these pieces, um, that property that would reflect on the interaction of those properties of those um, independent uh, elements. So instead of describing a property only in terms of being, we can try to understand it as a process of becoming. Emergent properties are the spontaneous outcome of, go of ongoing processes. Life, love, happiness, and success are not only one-time propositions, they have to be reproduced continuously. If the processes that generate them and the phenomena will also cease to exist. Uh, the last one is called counterintuitiveness. And these are means that actions intended to produce a desired outcome may in fact generate the opposite results. To appreciate counterintuitiveness, you need to understand the practical consequences of the following assertions. Cause and effect may be separated in time and space. An event happening at a given time and place may have a delay effect, producing an impact at a different time and at a different place. Cause and effect can replace one another, displaying circular relations. An event may have multiple effects. The order of importance may shift in time. A set of variables that initially play a key role in producing an effect may be replaced by a different set of variables at a different time. Removing the initial cause will not necessarily remove the effect. So for example, uh, social dynamics are fraught with counterintuitive uh, behavior. For example, the effects of smoking. So um, smoking can harden the arteries, uh, but also can help control weight and also can help reduce anxiety. Well, smoking also damage the lungs. So based on these four propositions, we can make a case that uh, smoking is bad for the heart or good for the heart. So this is what counterintuitive is, is trying to represent. So that concludes the lecture. Um, we discussed the system, system principles uh, and the system constructs. And also we provided introduction to system thinking. Uh, thank you for your time. And we'll, we'll talk again in the next video.